With thousands of ships dotting the English Channel in the early light of D-Day 1944, it created an awesome spectacle. The gigantic armada of Allied military might gathering off the coast of Normandy that day was the greatest mass of force the world had ever seen. And it would spearhead the liberation of Europe that morning. It would dramatically reverse the course of a long and deadly war. The only thing we could ever imagine more dramatic than that incredible D-Day spectacle would be a vast army descending out of the sky to liberate the whole of planet Earth, a massive heavenly army riding to the rescue. Such a scene may seem a spectacle only a science fiction writer could come up with. But today, we are going to learn just how that invasion is going to happen to end the longest, deadliest war in Earth's history. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. A German soldier on the Western Front named Hans would always remember the day that World War II ended for him. It was June 6, 1944. He'd seen years of fighting as a part of Hitler's proud, apparently invincible army. But now he felt like an old man. Hans and his comrades had been expecting an invasion for weeks. They were dug in on the long German line of defence along the coast of Normandy. But they believed the real threat had come and gone on the night of June 6. Thick, dark clouds had rolled over the skies. A strong wind was blowing. It didn't seem the Allies could stage an all-out assault from the air. But then, reports started coming over the radio. Paratroopers had landed here. Gliders were coming in there. Landing craft were approaching. In the middle of this turmoil, Hans received orders to take a reconnaissance patrol toward the coast. He gathered several infantrymen and prepared to set off. But just then, a British tank roared up and opened fire. Everyone scattered. Hans hid in some bushes and then tried to make his way back to the German lines. But he was captured by British paratroopers and moved towards the beach. Hans felt depressed at first. He'd been captured only a few hours after the invasion. He hadn't had a chance to really fight. But when the sun rose the next morning, Hans saw something that quickly changed his outlook. Spread over the ocean was an invasion fleet that stretched to the horizon, ship beside ship without break. And down on the beaches, Hans saw troops, weapons, tanks, ammunition and vehicles being unloaded in a constant stream. There seemed no end of it. Who could resist such an onslaught? Hans breathed a sigh of relief and told himself that really he was a lucky man. Clearly on D-Day 1944, there was only one side to be on, the side of the Allied forces pouring into Europe. Do you ever get the feeling that you've been part of a war, some prolonged conflict in your personal life? Do you ever feel worn down by the suffering that just seems to go on and on in our world? Do you ever wonder how it's all going to end? If it's ever going to end? In this series, Angel Wars, we've examined the cosmic conflict that began with a war in heaven. The angel Lucifer began a rebellion against God in heaven, which he then continued on this planet Earth. Lucifer, or Satan, tried to set up an alternative system to the government of God. And ever since, the result has been a disaster for all the universe to see. The intense struggle between good and evil has been going on for centuries here in our world. God's plan is to show that His way of love and fairness and freedom is best for humanity. Satan tries to coerce human beings into falling for his plan, which results in self-destruction and cruelty. And so we wonder, is it ever, really ever, going to end? 
How will this age-long conflict ever reach a resolution? Are we going to have to deal with sin and suffering forever? Or can love prevail finally, once and for all? Well, today I'd like to tell you the good news about how the war is ultimately going to end. I want to tell you who's going to win and how. And I'm going to tell you about the most spectacular invasion this planet will ever witness. The book of Revelation paints a picture for us. It's a picture that will greatly encourage and comfort you. The end begins when Satan tries to make a final stand against God on this earth. Satan will not go down without a fight. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 gives us a glimpse of that final war, that final crisis, that ultimate battle between good and evil. And the devil was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. In the book of Revelation, a pure woman stands for the true church, the faithful believers. The dragon or Satan is enraged with the woman, the church. Why? Because the church is the body of Christ on earth. The true church is carrying forward the work of Christ. And for Satan, striking out at the church is a way of striking out at his rival, his eternal enemy, Jesus Christ. Satan has been angry for a long time. When he couldn't be God, he became an angry, resentful, rebellious angel in heaven. He was angry during that first war in heaven. He was angry when he was cast down to this earth with his evil angels. He was angry when Christ defeated him at the cross, angry that the salvation plan succeeded. It was carried out despite his best efforts to subvert it. He was angry all through the dark ages when scattered groups of believers kept their simple devotion and faith to Christ alive. He was angry when the persecution he inspired failed to stamp out true faith from the earth. Satan has been angry for a long time and he just keeps getting angrier. Every time his schemes to deceive true believers fail, he gets angrier. Every time the gospel conquers new territory, he gets even angrier. But a time is soon coming when Satan's rage and anger will reach a climax. Revelation tells us that Satan, the dragon, is going to be enraged. He's enraged with the woman and the rest of her offspring. Who are these rest of her offspring? The Bible calls them the remnant those who remain faithful at the time of the end. This is the last church, the last group of faithful believers on the earth. And they're identified as those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast the testimony of Jesus. Satan is enraged with them. His rage born out of desperation. This is his last chance. He knows that history is coming to a climax. He knows his time is short. This is his last ditch effort to fight against Christ. This is all out war. The dragon goes to make war with the rest of her offspring, the last group of true believers. The war that began in heaven will burst out dramatically on this earth just before the end of history, just before Jesus comes again. Satan will try to attack those who remain faithful to Christ. Revelation chapter 13 describes this as a dragon making war against the saints. This dragon speaks blasphemy against God. Satan's hatred of God is now out in the open. He's gathering his evil forces for an assault on his rival. And many individuals will give the dragon or Satan their allegiance. Incredible as it may sound, they will actually worship him. But another group of people are not swayed by this powerful figure. They're not swept up by the mob that follows the beast. Revelation identifies this group very clearly in chapter 14 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12 
describes again God's faithful followers in the last days, God's last day people. Listen to chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. These saints stand true for God. They are set apart by God in the end time, distinguished by two things, an undying faith in Jesus and a desire to obey His commandments and follow Him. Both of these things are crucial. Faith in a Saviour and loyalty, devotion and a commitment to follow Him. And it's these people who are the object of Satan's attack. Picture this scene. Satan is moving against the remnant, against God's people. He wants to destroy them. He wants to finally crush them. Yet there is just a little time left. He wants to destroy them when there's just a little chance. And he has plenty of allies. Countless people have been seduced into following him. They've made wrong choices. They have chosen the crowd instead of conscience. They've chosen compromise instead of loyalty to the Word of God, the Bible. These individuals now find themselves fighting on the wrong side. They're on the side of force and coercion. They're on the side of cruelty. And they become a seemingly irresistible force, moving like an army against those faithful to Christ. But suddenly, everything will change. Here's how the Apostle John describes it. He saw this dramatic scene in a vision. It's recorded here in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 and 12. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns." What a scene! Suddenly the heavens will open. It seems that the sky is split apart. Something glorious and majestic is rushing out of eternity and into time. A figure rides on a white horse. A white horse, the symbol of conquering conquest. Yes, he's riding to the rescue. It's Jesus Christ. No one else has been so faithful and true. He promised to come and now he is coming. He promised to be with us in our hour of need and now he's here. He's determined nothing can stop him now. His eyes are like a flame of fire. He's going to deal with the one who's been deceiving and harassing and persecuting his people for so long. Satan is doomed. Christ's gaze is fiery and on his head he wears many crowns. What does that mean? This is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Those very words are inscribed on his robe. They are like a coat of arms of a great warrior. And this is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is the one destined to rule over all the kingdoms of all the earth. John saw Jesus as a great warrior riding down the corridor of the skies to the rescue. And then John saw more. In Revelation, the 19th chapter and verses 13 and 14, we read, He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. The great warrior's robe is dipped in blood, because blood is a symbol of deliverance. And because Christ has already won the crucial battle over the forces of evil at the cross when he shed his own blood, he earned the right to rescue weak, sinful human beings back then. He earned the right to be our rescuer, our hero. He earned the right to snatch us from the clutches of Satan, who claims that all fallen human beings belong to him. The robe of the warrior is dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. Jesus is referred to as the Word of God by the Apostle John, no less. Jesus is the Word who became flesh, 
Jesus is the expression of who God is in human form. But this time, he does not arrive on planet Earth as a baby in Bethlehem's manger. This is not an incarnation. This is an invasion. Jesus has company. A host of angels ride with him on white horses, clothed in fine white linen. No cavalry has ever looked more glorious coming to the rescue. And what happens? John describes it in symbolic terms. He says that a sharp sword proceeds out of Christ's mouth and he strikes the nations. What does this mean? The Bible tells us that all of creation was brought about by the word of the Lord. God speaks and things are created. Well, this Lord can wage battle in the same way. He doesn't need to bring out the artillery. He doesn't need to bomb the enemy. He just needs to command. His word stops the dragon and his armies in their tracks. His word liberates the faithful from the clutches of the enemy. Satan and those who have chosen to follow him are thrown into a lake of fire and consumed. The earth is purified by that fire and made completely new and free from suffering. And that's how the longest war ends. That's how evil and death are finally defeated. That's how eternal life begins for believers. The kind of life that's worth really living eternally. Life in a place where love and fairness rule unchallenged. Have no doubts. Jesus is going to win the battle. He's going to ride to the rescue. And no force from hell will be able to stand against him. Jesus is going to win. Sure, the world may look a very dark place right now. It may seem that cruelty is prevailing. But Jesus is going to win. He's going to prevail over cruelty. You may feel devastated right now. You may feel overwhelmed by all the bad things that have happened to you. But get this very clear. Jesus is going to win. He's going to prevail over every tragedy. He's going to make all things new. You may feel like you're on the losing side right now. You may feel trapped by circumstances. But just remember, Jesus is going to win. He's going to prevail over every dark force in this world. Jesus is the victor. Never, never forget that. He won his toughest victory at the cross. He's coming to claim those he's rescued with his blood, sweat and tears. He's not going to abandon any believer. He's determined. His eyes are flames of fire. His robe is dipped in blood. Crowns are upon his head. He rides the white horse of a great warrior. Jesus is coming to our rescue. And our eyes and our hearts look forward to the day when we will see the coming of the glory of the Lord. No matter how discouraged you may be right now, please remember, the best is yet to come. There's a whole new world coming. One of my favourite authors, Christian author Ellen White, gives us this picture of what happens after Christ's great victory. She says, The great controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. Hear these words, the best is yet to come. I want to be a part of that new world of unshadowed beauty and perfect joy. I want to stand with Christ right now. I want to make sure that he has my complete allegiance. Have you surrendered your heart to him? Have you said, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do it. Deep within my heart, Lord, I have a desire to please you. Lord, 
Show me tools from your word, even if they're different from what I've done before, I will follow them. I want to stand with the people that have faith in Jesus. I want to stand with the people that keep the commandments of God. I want to stand with the people that follow your truth. I want to make sure that I will look up at that incredible invasion filling up the sky and be able to say, this is my Redeemer. I've waited for him. Yes, Jesus is going to win. It's a privilege to place our lives in his hands today by faith, before the invasion begins. There will come a day when it's too late. We either crown him Lord of our hearts now or battle against him then when he comes. If he does not sit on the throne of our hearts now, we can never worship him when he sits on the throne of the universe. Will you open your heart to him now? Maybe you're a Christian and maybe he has new truth for you to follow. Will you say, Jesus, I will follow it. Jesus, I'll go wherever you lead. Please join me now as we pray. Dear Father, thank you for the ultimate happy ending. Thank you for the gift of Jesus who laid down his life for weak, sinful human beings. Thank you for the hope of him riding to the rescue. Thank you that Christ is our victor. We place our faith in Jesus just now and believe that we are on the winning side. In his name, amen. The time has come to say goodbye for another week. And so until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.